Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody, everybody, everybody. All you beautiful people out there that's watching me on Strong Inspirations, I can feel you. I know you're watching. Let me tell you one thing that happened, and I was kind of surprised at this. Well, first of all, let me tell you, I'm Anthony Brogdon. I'm, I'm the guy that came up with this ingenious idea to keep this history alive in this form. And so let me let me tell you what happened. I did an interview with a guy, and you need to watch this. It's on the channel. He's got a museum in Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, Cecil Williams is his name. He was a photographer, so on and so forth, for a Jet magazine. He told me somebody watched the video and loved what he was doing so much, they took a tour of his place. They came down his city because and told him. They saw it because they were watching Strong Inspirations. I like that. That's what I want to happen. And I'm just waiting on one of them young kids, them high schoolers or something else to contact me and said, hey man, I told my friends and we sat down and watched that video. Then I know I'm, I'm, I'm on to something anyway, but I'm waiting on that to happen and watch, I, I, it's, it's coming. And when you hear the story of the guests of today, you're gonna say that, somebody gonna watch it and say, hey, we gotta go to that library we're going to go to that town and see what they're talking about. I tell you this, how about this? I want you to subscribe to the channel. It's free. It don't cost you nothing. You don't give no information. All you do is hit the subscribe button. I want you to like this video because it's going to blow your mind. She said, I've been talking about it for a while now. I want you to hit the notifications bell. So, cause I'm putting four or five videos up a time and I put one up yesterday, it was about four o'clock in the afternoon with a guy who's uh, the CEO of a museum in Greensboro, North Carolina, where six guys, six, six guys and ladies college students sat at the lunch counter and said, we, we not getting up till you serve us. And it took three months. Now, not the same guy sat there the whole time, <laughs> understandably, but they rotated. It was a group effort. And that changed the landscape. And then other cities began to, had already flourished, but we really began to get and, 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 and gather steam because there was a synergy that happened. That had, I just put that up. Y'all need to watch that. John uh, Swain is his name. Uh, I need you to uh, tell somebody about strong inspirations. Don't keep it to yourself because it's happening. It's, it's, it's not me telling these stories. It's the people who know. They know it, and, and I, I, I do a little verification, but not much. I do a little verification, but not much. But I know you can count on what they're saying. They ain't got a lot of us. And then what I want you to do, and check it out. This is really in conjunction with what the guests did for me. I'm a filmmaker, Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. I did this documentary. It took me two years to do it, two and a half. I self-distributed, sold a bunch of copies, went around the country. And one of the places I went, which was one of my favorite spots, was at her location in Louisville, Kentucky. It was phenomenal. We were sat on the top of the building and had all the windows and the sun was shining in and the people had questions. Oh, man, she set it out for me. It was great. Oh, uh, Business in the Black, you need to watch this. It's uh, streaming on Amazon. And that's the DVD. And then I, and I don't know if she knows this, but I wrote a book. See, cause I'm serious about this game. So I wrote a book called Black Business Book. My book got over 200 facts, amazing stories. Matter of fact, I'm so confident in this book. If you read it and you know everything in this book, I give you money back. No questions asked. I send it back to you. I cash app your money back. Because I think if you know all this, you real good. Because the stuff in here that people don't teach. I know they didn't. I didn't know. That's why I did. That's why I embarked on this. Because I, I kind of stumbled on some of this stuff. Slaves who own businesses. I, you know they ain't tell me that. And I wanted to be self-employed like I am. So that's what's in my book. It's over 200 facts. It's an easy read. Um... You know, because I, I, I ain't no big reader. I don't tell nobody I told you that. I, I kind of skim through things. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, I, you know, I graduated from college, but I couldn't wait until that was over, so I can get out here in this real world and try my hand at it. And I've been doing it ever since. A long time too, my friends. So she's smiling, and I'm gonna tell her, "Hey, hold on one more second, because I want to say this: strong is the word that I use a lot. Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience." and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that's my introduction to my guest because she's a strong lady. Come on, tell us your name and let's get it on strong. And thank you for being on the channel. No problem. My name is Natalie Woods. I am the branch manager of the Historical Western Library in Louisville, Kentucky. Right on. And let me ask you a couple of questions. But are you from Louisville? I am born and raised. Did you know the history of the library before you got there? Did, had, had, had they kind of told y'all what was going on over there? It's not really taught. It's not really taught at all. I learned it as I started working for the library system. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and the library is located where in, in Louisville? 604 South 10th Street is right off of Chestnut Street out here. And is that the the, 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 uh, the Black neighborhood there? Or what, what is, where, where is it situated? Historically, um, this is where a lot of black businesses were back in the day. Um, a lot of that, of course, with redlining and, and different things like that all got demolished and torn down. Um, but this is a historical, very historical area. Now, uh, did you, did you, uh, I, I, I suspect, have you been to this branch for a number of years? Did you kind of say, I want to go to that branch because I'm familiar with it at some point? Or once you got there, you, you got an appreciation for where you were? How, kind of how did that flow? Well, when I started in the library system, I started out at the Shawnee Library. I started out as a page and I worked my way up from being a page to being a clerk. Um, I left Shawnee and became a full-time clerk in the main library. And um, after going to school and getting my librarian degree, my master's in library science, um, I applied to come here to Western and I've been here almost five years in this location. But I've been with the library system yeah. a little over 30. Yeah, oh, sure. Now, when, but, but when you applied, did you know what, what you were getting into? Did you know the, 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 the ghosts that were there, the, the voices that had been through there? I knew a tidbit of it. And the reason why I did is because, um, you know, you know a little bit of the history as you're working in the system. I've learned a whole lot more since I've been here, but I was given some documents of Reverend Thomas Fountain Blue, who was the first African-American librarian. And he was the first manager of this branch when it was created. And uh, I was given some of his papers to transcribe and was just amazed by how he was ahead of his time. and. I was on my way to library school at that time and it inspired me even more to do what I'm doing now. Wow. So now when you think of, uh, 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 oh, oh, let me ask you this, and, and we're not doing this live, I can edit. It, it, has this become a, a mission for you to, to, to share the history of this library for you personally and things that you've done in the neighborhood of the of, uh, nearby or what have you to, for others to know and that you didn't know growing up? Absolutely. Okay. I go everywhere to go all over the city. Um, anybody that's willing to listen, I call it boots on the ground. I'm, I'm out there running my mouth about the history of this branch because it's not taught. Nobody really knows anything about the history of this branch. This is the first African-American library in the nation run by a completely African-American staff. And a lot of people don't know that we're no more nationally than we are locally, and uh, it's my mission to try to change that. Oh, now I know when I was there, I saw the historical marker out front. When did yeah. that get there, and what kind of does that, you know, how did that, when did that historical marker get there, do you know? I'm not exactly sure how long the historical marker has been there. Um, it's been there for a while, because yeah. you, you look at it, and even when you were here, it was weather beaten. Yeah. <laughs> it, sure. it needs to be kind of refurbished a little bit, but um, it's been out there for quite a while. We also have a cornerstone on the front of the building where it used to say colored branch and they etched that particular part out of the out of the concrete block that used to say that. And right up above the front door, it used to say colored branch uh, back in that time as well. And of course, that's no longer there. Now, now uh, take us back. When did, when did the branch open and how did it become what it is? 
So Western started because Albert Mazik at the time was working at uh, Central High School, which was in a different location. Right now, Central is right down the street from us, but it was not there at that time. Um, but he wanted to take his students to the library and couldn't go to the library if you were black. So they were able to get an hour or so at the main library, but of course they could not go through the front doors. They had to go through in and out the back. And it was all about, um, you know, he was just like, this is not, this is not enough. We need, we need to have something of our own. And this is so, what, 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 what time period are we talking about? We're talking like in the early 1900s. Okay. Because this building, um, the Western, of course, was called the Western um, Colored Branch. And it first opened in 1905, but it did not open in this location. It opened in a house at 1125 West Chestnut Street, right down the street. But at the time, that, that building, of course, is no longer standing. It's been torn down since then. It was three rooms of that house that they started the library. And that was there until this building could be completed. Andrew Carnegie gave money to, uh, to for this building to be to be built, but it started with Albert Mazik petitioning to have this location uh, created, and then once it opened its doors, it's it's been rocking and rolling ever since. Now it, he he did this, but what's significant about that location? Why did they? Why you think they picked that corner, that block, what have you? I think probably because of the historical things that were happening right here, although, of course, to them at the time, they may not have thought that it was historic, but, sure. you know, we look back on it now, it was very historic. We had the uh, historical Quinn Chapel, the original building, sits right on the corner of uh, Ninth and Chestnut. That particular building is where uh, Martin Luther King Jr. used to come and organize and give speeches, and I've been told that the Underground Railroad uh, ran underneath the church. Um, the building next to it where the YMCA is now was was not the YMCA. It was an organization called uh, Knights of the Pythias and they were in, it was a black organization that was in that building. Western was here. There was just a lot of different things in this in this area for everybody to come together. I've even had patrons to come and tell me that they had heard uh, Martin Luther King Jr. speak in our meeting room. Um, which oh. floors me, you know, just to yeah. think about, you know, how much history has passed through, you know, uh, Reverend Blue was not a trained librarian. So he was a reverend, you know, he was Reverend Thomas Fountain Blue, and he was hand selected um, after he had worked with the YMCA and doing other different things to be the manager of this branch. And when he did, he realized there's no place for, if you're an African-American, if you're Black, you, you have no place to go to be trained to be a librarian. So he created, along with Rachel Harris, who was the children's librarian here, they created a library school that was ran out of this building so that if you were wanted to be, um, to work in the library and be a librarian, this was the place that you came to to be trained um, to do library work at that time. So he, he, he not just uh, only had the offer of books and research and things that libraries do, he actually had some rooms and some teachers to, 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 uh, to, to educate people on how to become a librarian. He, I do believe he was the one doing the educating. I do believe that it was him and, and Rachel Harris. They were, they were the ones that conducted all of that and they ran it right out of this building. And, and we, if you come here and physically in this building, you look around and you think, how in the world did they do all that in this space? Because the building is big, but it's not that big. Okay. But back then, you know, you, you work with what you had and right. they right. definitely made it work. Now, when you when you when you uh, the first thing you, when you think of a, of a library is books. Where did they get the books from? I do believe that they had people who were donating books. Um, they may have had money to to purchase some. Um, I'm not really sure. There's there's a lot of details from that time that are kind of hazy. Okay. Um, because they didn't they wrote some things down, but they didn't write everything down. Sure. And then of course you know, documents over time, did, you know, deteriorate or become misplaced. So I spent a lot of time doing research, just trying to know all of the history from that time. So that way I can pass it on to generations that are here now to keep continuing right. to pass down the story of this, of this library. 
Uh, yeah, I guess the, the I guess the one thing that uh, that comes to my mind is in 19, 5, 10, 20, what have you, how many books were out there that had been published that could be in a library? You, you, you follow me? I mean, those are the early days. I've seen photographs of the shelves at the time, and the the shelves were all full. They were okay. all full of books, and you know, any book that was published out there. You know, they, but they were very selective about what they had because they wanted to make sure that um, it really gave to the Black experience, you know, that they were really getting fully educated on anything and everything that they wanted to have access to. So he was very selective about the types of, of titles that he, that he put into the, to the brand. Like, what, what could have been the hours that they operated? The hours, I'm not, honestly, I'm not sure. Some oh, of the days. things that I've looked at, I want to say maybe kind of something a little similar to what regular hours would be like now. Maybe they might have opened about nine or 10 o'clock and might have closed about five. I don't know that they stayed up in real late. Yeah. Like now we, so, you know, some branches will have hours to eight or nine o'clock. Sure. Like, you know, we stay open until eight. I don't know if they stayed open that late. Sure. When, when, when you, uh, did they allow people to check the books out? Yes, he, okay. in his writings, he wrote up the policy, the, the way that he wrote that is really some of the things that we were doing today. You know, like how long a person can check out a book, um, the information that you needed to collect from the person to know who had your book right. so that you could try to get it back, you know, their contact information, right. things like that. They didn't really, I don't know if they necessarily had a library card system back then like we have now, but they, you know, it was a lot of honor system, you know, to okay. make sure that people were bringing the books back and they did, they loved it. Did, did, did how, how big was uh, the, uh, the, the, the attendance? Do you, uh, if you have any idea, at some point were African-Americans at that point just so hungry to learn that yeah. it was flooded? Maybe, could you imagine that? There were lines out the door waiting on it to open, that kind of thing, or what, what's, from, what's your take on it? From some of the things that I have read, it was, it was packed. It was always packed because this was the only place that you could go, you know, in the city of Louisville, this was it. So, you know, you didn't have the opportunity if you were black to go to another library um, in the city. You had, this is where you would need to come. So, you know, if they were able to get here, it stayed packed. A lot of the pictures that we have are wall-to-wall -wall kids and they used to have the story times um, and the different programs that they had. It was it was wall-to-wall -wall with the kids in here with books and yeah. in their hands and reading and the adults as well. Do, do you have an idea of uh, some of the programs that they might have had during those days? Uh, kids read they had or the, that kind of the thing? Boys, they had the Du Bois debating club, the debate, debating team, where they would sit down and talk about whatever it was going on at the moment um, that was a hot topic. Um, and they would sit down and they would sit down and, you know, debate whatever those topics were. They, uh, like I said before, they had a lot of uh, children's, story times where they would come in and sit down in the library and would read a book to them pretty much like we do today. They did it okay. back then too. Um, they would have, so where the archives is at now, it did not used to be like this. They took part of our meeting room space to create the archives because the archives was in a smaller room that looked like a really bad hoarding situation with books and everything just sitting everywhere. So they created the archives to be able to spread all the information out with all the documents and the books and things we have in here. But the meeting room that we had, it had a stage and different things like that. So this was like a community center as well as a library. So they would put on plays and musicals and you name it, and they they pretty much had it at that time um, in the meeting room and at here because this, you know, it, it just served multiple purposes um, for the community. Uh, I gotta ask this, you know, that maybe the little shade on did did, did the racists do something to try to close the library at some point? Seeing how how successful it was, did they, you know, did the did the clan try to burn it down? Did any of those kind of instances happen that you know? Not that I'm aware of. I know Western has faced possible closure twice in the past, um, but that was due to funding. Um, I don't think that that was due to anything racial. Okay. It was just due to funding, you know, and trying to 
be able to staff it and, and do the different things like that um, at that time. Do, do you know if uh, uh, Carnegie himself ever came by there? That I don't know. I know he, he gave money for a lot of buildings to be created. I'm not really sure if he ever actually stepped foot in any of them. Okay. I mean, at some point he might have, yeah, but sure. I'm not real sure if he did or not. Uh, have you seen uh, some of the, uh, any of the oldest books? Do you have like uh, some of the older books in a, in, a, in, a, in a glass case on display or anything like that that says, we, this is the oldest book we found here? We, we do have some of our books that are over there. We call them our extremely rare and delicate books um, that we keep in little um, archival cases to, to try to keep the dust and things like that off of them. And they're very fragile to, to handle. And they might go back to when? Oh, uh, I do believe there's some that go back into the 1800s. Wow. Yeah, it's, being here is... Uh, it's an honor, first of all, to to sit here every day and to be surrounded by this history. But it's just amazing because every single day I learn something new, whether it's a patron coming in and talking to me about how they used to come here as a child or and the experience that they had or sitting and looking at some of the documents, because we're going to start digitizing those the materials that are here and those that we can make public. We're going to put it up on our website. So we're in the process of indexing to see everything that we have and stuff like that. But we spend a lot of time reading. <laughs> and that's why I was smiling a minute ago because you tell me how, you know, you try, you skim. Yeah. But once you get in here, you don't skim. Right. You just get so engrossed in what you're looking at and, and reading that history that it's hard to really put it down. Um, when you, when you uh, go there, is there something in the building that, uh, I mean, you're talking about a building that's over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. how, how, how is was was it a state-of-the-art building when it was first built you know I mean uh, maybe back then they didn't have running water they you know didn't have toilets I don't know you know what the conditions were were there things say, like that in the building that had to be renovated to bring up the code and that kind of thing well yeah there there was obviously you know they didn't think about handicap accessibility at that time so right. there was no such thing as a handicap ramp there was right. no elevators right. or anything right. like that so the building has been updated um to put a handicap ramp out in front of the building to add an elevator so we lost some of the space where normally staff would have been working like little work rooms or whatever it might have been used for at the time so we did lose some of those spaces and, and to add in the bathrooms and rearrange the way that they were and stuff right. like that. at that time it was probably state-of-the-art but we've had to make a few little small modifications to to keep it up to code and, and make it where it's accessible for everybody as much as possible and, and it had electricity though at the time well no maybe yeah. not i don't know I, I want to say that it did. Some of the photos that I've seen, I've seen lights hanging from the ceiling. Really? Like now you will see uh, drywall and different things like that on there. But it's some of the old photos, when you look at it, the walls were like the concrete cylinder blocks where they just painted over them when they from when they built it and stuff like that. So right. while it's gone through a lot of changes, it still has kept a lot of its original um, feel and look, you know, kind of things and stuff like that to it. When it, when it first opened, how many staff would you say? Was it just the two of them or they had others that? No, actually this, I don't know how well you can see this picture back here on the wall. Yeah. There was seven of them. Okay. Um, and it had uh, Reverend Blue, Rachel Harris, and then the other five ladies that were, that were here with them at the time. Um, and they were the ones that, that ran the branch. Now, uh, you, 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 when you qualify, the, the, the historical significance, you say ran by African-Americans. Do you know of other libraries that were open that accepted African-Americans? And is there one that is considered the first to do such? There, I do believe is another library in another state that says that they were the first, but they were not, they did not have an African-American staff. Um, we were the first that was completely for African Americans and ran completely by African Americans. What, what you said earlier was that there were other libraries, understandably, in Louisville, mm -hmm. but they might not have admitted uh, blacks to come in. To what, was the, what was the conditions? What, give me an we're idea. We're not allowed to go to any other library, and that's the only library that um, 
that they were able to go to for an hour at a time. And I don't know how often that was, yeah. was our main library. And that's why the petition was created to create Western so that there would be a library for African-Americans to go to whenever they wanted. This, why, this why, why is it called Western? Hmm. How did they come up with that name? It may be because it's in, you know, the what they consider to be the first part of West Louisville because we have the 9th Street. Um, and usually people say when you pass 9th Street, you're headed into the West End when you're coming down to this part of town. So that may be why they decided to call it Western. There used to also be another branch that Reverend Blue was the manager of, and they opened after this one, and it was called the Eastern Color Branch, and it was over on Lambton Street. The building is still there, but it is no longer a library, And but that's considered to be over in the Eastern section, so I'm thinking that they were just naming them after, you know, the parts yeah. of town, like this is the East End, and this is the West End, so that's kind of what I figured the naming kind of came from. Was, was there ever an effort to uh, rename it in his honor or something? Is there something to that effect? Western slash his name or what have you? Mm -mm. No, it's, it's always been um, the Western Library. And they don't typically rename any of our branches after anybody. Yeah. Um, so it will probably always just be called Western, which is what it's known as. Yeah. How, how did people hear about this? You said you're known nationally more than in Louisville. How, how did the word get out, do you think? Probably because, you know, people who have come here to visit, um, put it out there. There are documents and things like that written about Reverend Blue. Um, I know some people have come in and done their dissertations. There's also Professor Joseph Cotter, who um, would come along with uh, Albert Mazik and Reverend Blue, and they all kind of work together on doing different things. Professor Cotter was a poet, an author. Um, he also had a son um, named after him, it was Junior. But Professor Cotter uh, Sr. has an, uh, uh, was a, um, I guess you could say a housing development that was named after him called Cotter Homes. Um, but he also, while he was here, had a program called the Cotter Cup that was named in his honor. And the Cotter Cup was a storytelling contest for children. And anybody who had attended any of our story times could come and whoever retold the stories that they had heard the best are the ones that won the Cotter Cup. Okay. And I brought it back this year and in, in his honor made it a poetry writing contest um, and opened it up for you know kids in school from elementary all the way through high school to uh, participate and to write program, you know, write their poetry and stuff like that for the program. Um, but Professor Cotter, because he was known, you know, whenever they would go out and they would speak in different places, it became to be known. Okay. And Reverend Blue, I do believe, was the first African American to speak at the American Library Association conferences. So through time, doing different things like that, the library school that they ran out of here, all those different types of things kind of helped to get the story told throughout, you know, um, yeah. nationally, that kind of really helped to make sure that the, the stories were still being told. Yeah, had you heard that like the History Channel has done a story on it or anything like that, uh, per I se? Haven't, but we have been contacted by um, various organizations that are doing stories about libraries and, okay. and wanting to tell the history and things like that. Um, so it's, it's always something random in yeah. some random place where somebody has heard some information sure. and then they come in and I, we give tours. So, you know, we have a form on our website where somebody can sign up for a tour or for an archival appointment, which we give an hour at a time. Um, and when people fill out the form, we ask for them to fill out as much information as possible as far as what they're looking for. So that way, when they get here, they get the most use out of their time. We're not spending that hour sure. to, you know, to do sure. the research. We've already got the information that they need um, already ready for them. So there's just, yeah. uh, you know, various different ways that people are hearing stuff. But when usually when I do a tour and people come in and they do that and then they go back home and then they tell you know, the story of coming here in the history. We have people that just go around and look at the historical markers, you know, and, and then they go into some of the different places. We had a lot of people during the time of COVID 
when we, you know, of course we're still in the time of COVID, but when COVID first started, yes. things shut down and people were just going around and just, just to get out of the house and just doing tours of different things like historical markers. Okay. And so they would have a list of places that they wanted to go back and see when, um, when they were able to get back into the buildings again. Was, um, what's it, what's in the archives? When people talk about what are archives and what, what kind of what's in your archives? Well, our archives is called the African American Archives. We have various different types of original documents. Um, we have documents of Reverend Blues that belong to Reverend Blue that he wrote in, in different articles that he was published in magazines and stuff like that. We have the, uh, the papers of Professor Cotter, which we have a lot of, of students who come here that are working on their dissertation will come in and, and do their uh, research on him. We have a lot of other different kinds of various documents on the neighborhoods and organizations throughout time um, here in Louisville and in the West End. We have a lot of different, I'm looking around now, looking at all the different stuff we have in here. We have a lot of different books um, based on African-American history. Some of them are the only copies that you can find in some places or some of the last copies that are out there. Really? Yeah, really? and so there's just, a, there's a lot of, a lot of different stuff and I'm still filtering through everything myself trying to sure. figure out everything that we have because nobody ever kept a running list and index of everything that we have so sure. there's there's probably a whole lot of other exciting stuff in here that we yeah, have, I I have no idea. we even have a diploma from 1911 you know diploma is like from high school you know now you get them they're like this and this yeah. thing was like it was huge. Really? And, it, and I was like, whoa, oh. well, I don't make them that big anymore. But, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's really nice to see, um, you know, and learn from, from that history. Cause you got to know, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've came from. Right. Exactly. Uh, as we kind of come to close, I want to divert just a tad on, on this note. Uh, how did African-Americans get education to learn to read? Uh, you know what I mean? Were, were the schools there? Because uh, you're talking about, you know, we're still not many years off slavery. I mean, it's 30 years or so at that point. And there were schools that were doing it. How, 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 what was the, if you can imagine or have read the attitude of how bad the desire was to get an education? And then, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about just in the schools, but outside of the school, I really want to get education and I'm going to take it another step further in my spare time. I'm going to the library. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think that, 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 that what might've been? Well, you know, there, there were schools and different things like that to, to go to and attend back at that time. And in, in Louisville, different in grade Louisville. schools and that kind of thing. There, there were schools in it, but you had to think about, they didn't have the things then that we have now you know now you have kids on ipads and iphones yeah, yeah, sure sure everybody's trying to do media and do all these different types of things sure none of that existed back then the sure. only thing that they had were books that's all they had that's all they had were books so you have to think about those types of things you know there was always this constant thirst for knowledge always a constant thirst for knowledge because that's all they had were books, you know, it, it helped to create that imagination in the mind, you know, where we're always trying to get kids to read now, where everybody is so distracted by, right. you know, TV or whatever the case may be. None of those distractions existed back right. then. Right. You know, I mean, you would go outside and maybe play or something to that nature, but books were it. Books were everything. So they always wanted to be in the library to that thirst for knowledge was extremely strong. You know, and so much so one little thing I want to I didn't mention yeah, before please. was, um, you know, when when Western possibly faced closure um, and we, I guess, must have made national news on some level. And, and you're talking about when when you talking about I'm talking about like back in 2001. OK, Prince, the okay. Prince, the okay. Mr. Purple Rain himself. Yes. Heard of, of about Western. And I don't know exactly how he came upon the information about Western, um, but he did learn that information. And as he did, he made a $12,000 donation to this branch all the way back in that time. Um, but it, of course it was anonymous. None of this came out until his passing. 
you know, of one of the, of how he was, you know, such a philanthropist and gave money to different organizations. And then, and we just happened to be blessed to be one of them that he gave money to at that time. And that I don't know what all they used the money for. I do believe a lot of it was used for programming and stuff like that, but he did hear about this rich history and stuff like that and believed in it just, just like I do, you know? Yeah, I love it. I love it. And, and, and again, I know you alluded to this and let's say, uh, but the, the, it, it's in the black neighborhood, the school. So there was a black housing across the street, the church, so on and so forth. So it it, it was the beacon in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I love it. it. Is they they consider it to be a separate flame. You know, it it stands out because it was the first, and because you know it it led you know, to, on to so many other different things, you know, the library school that they did out of here, all the different kinds of things and, you know, Reverend, all the different things. Remember, Reverend Blue was very big about education and he was really big about making sure that um, the advancement, I think one of the things I read, he said it was like for the advancement of our people to make sure that they have the access to the education that they want or to the books that they want to read, the importance of those different types of things. So Western has always been that, that separate flame that has stood out even today in in our current library system yes. it is that one that you know that's pushing the envelope and that's because when i got here i wanted to make sure that i was continuing picking up where he left off kind of a thing you know and continue that whole thing about community so keeping that kind of ideas and attitude going about it and doing things, thinking outside the box and doing doing programming a little bit differently. All right, got it. Is there a date that you all celebrate as the opening of the branch? No, we don't normally typically uh, do that unless it gets around to like the 100 years, you okay. know, those different types of celebrations. We do have a block party each year. Oh, let's talk about it. Yeah, we come into it. Yeah, tell the people, let's go. Yeah, so um, I did not just schedule one for this year, sure. but I do plan on doing it next year. Sure. My plan was to do it last year and have it as a Juneteenth celebration. The actual date for the branch, I'm not exactly sure the actual date. I just know that the year was 1908. 1908, okay. Mm -hmm. Like I said, they started in 1905 in that house. Right. But then this building opened up in 1908. Lastly, is there something uh, unique about the construction of the building um, that they tried to do? I don't know if there's anything unique. We made a discovery this year by accident uh, that the way that they ran the um, gutters, you know, normally, typically you see the gutters on the buildings built today, the way that they, they run, you know, you can see them, but they try to, you know, construct them where you can't, they're not obvious that they're right. there. Okay. Well, apparently back in that time, they ran the gutters inside the building. So our gutter for the building, and I don't know if they'll be able to, to do something different with it, but it runs from inside the building all the way across the front of the building to go out on the other side because it was an aesthetic thing. You know, they didn't want you to see gutters. Now in the back of the building, the gutters are there, but okay. the front of the building, they were hidden. Okay. And that became a little bit of an issue when we had a clog in the drain and yeah. water started to come out the wall, which we got all that stuff fixed. But yeah. that's how we made the discovery that, uh, that at least I did, that yes. the gutter ran inside the building. I got you. I guess my last, is there are, are murals, uh, paintings on the walls or something like that of, uh, of anything have, of note? We do have a mural in our meeting room. Um, that I usually walk people through when they come in for a tour. Okay. Um, that's in there. We have pictures in the archives. We don't have anything upstairs on the first floor. Okay. Um, just so that it doesn't look as cluttered. Um, okay. Because of the way the, you know, the reconstruction, how different things are moved around. But we do have a mural in our meeting room. Okay. That, that tells the history of of western okay well uh, you know i, I want to say I, I thank you so very much and 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 to those uh library people in 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 louisville for allowing you and you taking your time out of your busy schedule to share this with us not a problem to, to share this history to let people know and, and 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 i asked the question and you answered it so eloquently that we wanted to get an education what no question about it we knew the importance of it we wanted to read, we still do read, 
-hmm. and 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 life is good yeah uh and so with that i want to say i really uh appreciate you again I, I want you with all sincerity to stay strong stay safe stay on your grind this is this has become your mission this is your marker in life i i and, and I, you told me that uh to earlier and i know you feel it you you're doing the, your good things to educate the people to 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 know about the resources that you don't have to just get it off the computer go get it in the book see it in print because it exercises your mind a little bit better Absolutely. more effectively and so i thank you again everybody this is what we do with strong inspirations i find the people i, I asked a few questions i let them do the talking this is what we do hit that subscribe button hit the like button on this video tell somebody about strong inspiration let's go down there and your people in louisville who you haven't been through that life go check it out mm -hmm. go see it go support it and uh let the people know and, and, and let's keep those numbers up high of the attendance and so with that i say we'll be down there soon uh thanks again have a good day you're welcome you too bye-bye bye-bye